Assalamu alaikum everyone, this is Zaman Nazir and welcome back to Knowledge Realm. Students, we are studying pre-partition history of Pakistan and we are studying all the events chronologically and we are trying to cover almost all the events explained by Ahmed Said in the book Track to Pakistan. This is the source of the lectures that I'm giving here. And uh, in the last lecture, we studied similar deportation of 1906. Then we studied Minto Morley reforms of 1909 and Kanpur Mosque tragedy of 1913. So in today's lecture, we're going to cover the time period from 1916 to 1919. And uh, we would cover the two most important events that took place in these years. It would be Lucknow Pact of 1916 and Montego Chamsford reform of 1919. The source of this lecture is, once again, Track to Pakistan, the book recommended by FBSC by Ahmed Said. So we're going to cover almost all the important facts of these two events. And I'll try to make it simple and very easy for all the CSS aspirants. So without even wasting a single second, let's get started. So students, we're going to start with the Lucknow Pact of 1916. And I believe that all of you are already familiar with this pact. This is not a new topic for Pakistani students, especially. I mean, all of you must have studied this once in your life, in your elementary education. But unfortunately, these topics, I mean, the topics of pre-partition history of Pakistan are not taught very well in schools of Pakistan. But today, students, we are not just going to study this for the sake of exams. We're going to cover this. We are going to understand this to make an understanding of the pre-partition history of Pakistan. We're going to try to cover it very comprehensively. So let's get started. Student, if you are asked that what was Lucknow Pact? So the one line answer to this question would be, that it was a pact between the Indian National Congress representing Hindus and All India Muslim League representing Muslims of India. It was a pact of Hindu-Muslim unity. In 1916, Hindus and Muslims of India got united to take some benefits from British government. They got united against British government so that they could take some advantage from the government. This could be the one line answer or a very simple answer to the question that what was Lucknow Pact? This is very easy to memorize. This is very easy to keep in mind. But we would definitely not stop here and just get satisfied with this one line answer we are required to study this in detail so let's start with the background of lucknow pact what happened in 1960 or what incidents took place in the history that made muslims and hindus realize that yes now time has arrived that we both nations should shake hands and should get united against British government. What was the situation of the society at the time? So students, let's start with this story. In 1914, World War One started in Europe. Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria-Hungary, all these powers were engulfed in World War One, And with the wake of World War One, the movement for self-government gathered momentum in India. Why? Because British were engulfed in World War One, and they were humiliated in their country and they could not take care of the matters of India very well. They were already pressurized. So Hindus and Muslims thought of pressurizing British even more to take some advantage from them, to take some benefits from them. They, they wanted to take benefit of this opportunity. They wanted to take advantage of this chaos. So they shook hands and they got united. Another reason behind this pact is that 
some events of past disillusion hindus and muslims with british hindus and muslims realized that british do not think of the betterment of the prosperity of india and hindus and muslims but all they want is their own benefit they realized that british is a selfish government what were these events first of all it was the partition of bengal in 1905 hindus were perturbed with this partition they thought they claimed they accused that british is trying to divide hindus and muslims so this partition perturbed hindus then the annulment of partition of bengal in 1911 perturbed muslims it was the time when muslims realized that british would never do anything to protect muslims british does not want betterment of muslims so this was the event that disillusioned hindus and muslims another event was the kanpur mosque tragedy of 1913 in 1913 muslims were massacred in kanpur i have explained this topic in the previous lecture so if any of you wants to study this can definitely go to my previous lecture and study this in detail i have explained it in detail there so kanpur mosque tragedy was also an event that disillusioned muslims of india so muslims and hindus got united and they thought of pressurizing british in the situation of chaos because british was engulfed in world war 1 it was already pressurized in its own state it was busy in war so muslims and hindus just thought of making the situation even worse for british and take advantage of the chaos when these two nations got united and uh, they were ready to compromise their personal interest and they shake hands for the sake of the country but muslims were skeptical of hindus perfidious nature they were not satisfied with this oral agreement and uh, the only the exchange of words of this unity they wanted to make sure that hindus do not intend to hurt muslims in any way so they wanted to make sure of their rights and they wanted a pact from hindus so the two major parties representing two nations in india that is congress and all india muslim league muslim league were required to unite in 1915 due to jinnah's untiring efforts both parties held their meetings simultaneously in bombay it was the annual meeting of indian national congress and all india muslim league and um, the annual session held in bombay simultaneously and um, it was an indication that yes now both parties are coming closer for the pact then they shook hands to strengthen hindu muslim unity and in 1916 both parties met in lucknow and signed a pact that was called lucknow pact this was a pact of hindu muslims unity so this was all about the background of lucknow pact what events were there that led to this pact what happened in the society at the time and why muslims and hindus were there to get united so students we have studied the background of lucknow pact the soul of lucknow pact and now we know that lucknow pact was the pact between hindus and muslims and it was a pact of hindu muslim unity but students there was a difference of opinion muslims and hindus both these nations viewed the hindu muslim unity differently muslims had their own view and hindus had their own view so let's see how muslims viewed hindu muslim unity well actually students muslim leaders always wanted hindus and muslims united in true sense since ever they wanted all the nations of india united 
before the arrival of British, Hindus and Muslims and in fact all the nations of India were living under a Muslim empire, Mughal empire in India. So this proves that Muslim leaders never wanted to create a rift between Hindus and Muslims. They never wanted to do anything to hurt Hindus in any way. In fact, they wanted Hindus and Muslims united. So why they were not just satisfied with this oral agreement of unity and why they wanted this pact in a written document? What were the things that were causing fear in the hearts of Muslim leaders? What threatened these leaders? Well, students, we have studied almost all the events of pre-partition history of Pakistan till 1916 and we have studied many events in the history that made Muslim leaders realize that Muslims and Hindus are two separate nations. I would recall all the events. First of all, it was the Hindi-Urdu controversy of 1867 that made Sir Syed Ahmad Khan realize that Hindus and Muslims are two separate nations. They cannot live together. After this, Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan gave two nation theory. It made Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan realize that if ever Hindus get a chance to rule India, Muslims would be crushed under the rule of Hindus. Muslims realized after these events. First of all, it was the Hindi Urdu controversy of 1867. Then it was the partition of Bengal in 1905 when Hindus kicked a severe storm of protest when Lord Curzon partitioned Bengal. Hindus were perturbed with this partition. They were not happy with this partition. Then the Kanpur Mosque tragedy of 1913. All these events made Muslim leaders perturbed all these re events made Muslim leaders realize that they should do something to protect their rights. So this was the reason that they wanted this agreement in, in a written document and they were, not, they were not ready to be satisfied with just oral agreement and the shaking of hands. No, not at all. They wanted to make sure of their rights. They did not want to put themselves on risk. So this is the reason that Muslims made this pact because they wanted to protect their rights. Muslims wanted Hindu Muslim unity, but they did not want to risk their lives also. So they were doing everything to protect themselves. They demanded separate electorates in 1906, similar deportation and um, the annulment of partition of Bengal also disillusioned Muslims. The Muslims realized that British would never do anything to protect Muslims. Muslims realized that British are not worthy of trust. So this was the view of Muslims on Hindu-Muslim unity. Yes, they wanted Hindus and Muslims united in India, but not on the cost of their own lives. They wanted Hindus and Muslims united, but they wanted themselves protected also. So this was the reason that they demanded separate electorates and then they demanded a pact from Hindus also, from Indian National Congress also. And after 1913, All India Muslim League changed its constitution also. So this was all the all about the view of Muslims on Hindu-Muslim unity. Now let's see how Hindus viewed Hindu-Muslim unity. Well, uh, fortunately, Hindus also wanted Hindus and Muslims united. They wanted, apparently, they wanted the unity of Hindus and Muslims. But they wanted this unity only in hearts and mind. They wanted this unity only in words, orally, between people. They wanted people united, but only in words and uh, 
only shaking of hands and exchange of good and sweet words this was their view of hindu muslim unity they did not want muslims to do anything for protection of their rights this shows that there was something wrong with the intentions of hindus because they did not want any separate representation of muslims separate electorate of muslims perturbed hindus they deplored partition of bengal of 1905 they viewed all india muslim league as a rival party they did not like any step taken by muslims for the protection of their rights they believed that indian national congress was the only party of india and it represents all the nations of india so these were the acts of hindus that instilled doubts in muslim leaders and muslim leaders started fearing their rights started fearing the acts of hindus hindus just wanted muslims on a side they wanted to represent muslims that was not possible they used to say that yes we are united and indian national congress represent all the nations of india but they were not ready to accept any step taken by muslims to protect the rights of muslims so this was a difference of view of hindu muslim unity by muslims and hindus muslims wanted hindus and muslims united but in true sense they wanted these two nations united and they wanted the protection of their rights also but hindus they wanted hindus and muslims united only in a mere oral sense only in words and not in a written document they did not want representation of muslims so these were the things that were fearing muslims of india so this was all about the views of hindu hindus and muslims on hindu muslim unity and i wanted to share this knowledge here because this was my analysis that what caused muslims to demand this fact so students now let's see what were the efforts of qadi azam muhammad ali jinnah for hindu muslim unity well ahmed said in his book truck to pakistan says that lucknow pact was the culmination of muhammad ali jinnah's efforts So let's see what he did. Well, unlike Sir Syed Ahmed Khan, Qadi Azam advocated Hindu-Muslim unity till 1929. Sir Syed was also of the view that Hindus and Muslims should be united, but only till 1867. After 1867, his view changed. But Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Shina advocated Hindu-Muslim unity till 1929. After 1929. Qadi Azam said that now this is the time of parting ways but 1929 until 1929 he advocated this unity he believed that british succeeded in colonizing india just because of the disunity among the nations of india so he tried to unite indian national congress and all india muslim league and it was his efforts that in december 1915 both the parties held a combined annual session in bombay sarojini nedo who was a politician in india called muhammad ali jinnah ambassador of hindu muslim unity and in december 1916 an agreement was reached between hindus and muslims that was called lucknow pact and it is said that it was the culmination of muhammad ali jinnah's efforts So we can say that Muhammad Ali Jinnah did a great effort for Hindu Muslim unity and for Lucknow Pact. So now let's study the important features of Lucknow Pact of 1916. First of all, Hindus agreed to the right of separate electorates of Muslims. Hindus acknowledged that yes, Muslims are a separate nation and they should be given they should be granted with the right of separate electorates. then hindus conceded that muslims would have one third representation in the imperial legislative council 
then a weightage formula was proposed for Muslim representation in the Legislative Council and um, it was also decided that no non-official member would present any bill, resolution or part of it related to any other nation in any elected body if three-fourths of the members of the affected nation opposed it. Now this clause, this feature here, the feature number four ensures the protection of the rights of the nations because it says that the resolution would not be passed if three-fourths of the members of the affected nation opposed it. So this right here protects the nation. Then members of Imperial Legislative Council should be increased to 150 and four-fifths of those be elected by public. Then the president of the council be elected by the members and not the government. Then another feature, there should be more autonomy of provinces. All the members of the council should have the rights to ask the supplementary questions. Before Lucknow Pact, the members of council could not ask supplementary questions. Then half of the members of the executive council of governor general must be Indians who should be elected by the members of Imperial Legislative Council. Then judiciary must be separated from executive and no officer should be delegated with judicial authority. These were some of the important features of Lucknow Pact of 1916. Now let's move. All right, so now let's see how Muslims reacted to this pact. While the opinion of Muslims was divided on the pact, those who followed Sir Sayed's school of thought opposed it because they believed that Hindus and Muslims are two separate nations. They believed in two nation theory. So they opposed it. They said that Hindus and Muslims can never be united. So this was a futile effort. But those who supported Indian National Congress supported the pact. They believed that yes, Hindus and Muslims should be united they should be united against British government and they should put some demands in front of government. But Mia Muhammad Shafi, who was the leader of Punjab Muslim League, opposed it vehemently. He was a follower of Sir Sayyid's school of thought. He opposed it. And uh, Bengali Muslims also opposed it because due to the weightage formula, their majority turned into minority. And uh, they opposed it. Bing Bengal was majorly Muslims, but uh, there was a weightage formula presented in Lucknow Pact that uh, converted majority of Muslims into minority in the Provincial Legislative Council. So this was the reason Bengali Muslims opposed it. What was the reaction of Hindus? Well, uh, the reaction of Hindus was also divided. Hindus of UP opposed the acceptance of separate electorate. They called it undue appeasement of Muslims and uh, Hindus and Sikhs of Punjab also opposed it. So their opinion was also divided. Uh, those who were moderate Hindus, they, they supported this, they liked it. They said that yes, Hindus and Muslims should be united. So this is how Hindus and Muslims reacted to Lucknow Pact of 1916. All right, so now let's study the importance of Lucknow Pact of 1916. Lucknow Pact was the culmination of Qaeda Azam's persistent efforts for Hindu-Muslim unity and uh, a very important aspect of this pact is that Muslims' right of separate electorate was acknowledged for the first time by Hindus. It shows that Muslims were, for the first and last time, were accepted as a separate nation by Hindus and this was a very great achievement by leaders of all india muslim league and the myth of congress being a sole spokesman of the whole india was exploded it was accepted that yes there is another political party in india that represents muslims of india and that is all india muslim league then muslims were provided with the guarantee that no resolution would be passed without their consent and indian leaders also started gaining political experience. So this was the importance of Lucknow Pact of 1916. This was all about Lucknow Pact, 
we have studied lucknow pact in much detail we have studied the background of the situation at the time why muslims and hindus got united what was happening in europe at the time what was pressurizing british and what is the view of muslims on hindu muslim unity what was was the view of hindus on hindu muslim unity what were the important features of lucknow pact how kaidya some did efforts for this agreement and what is the importance of lucknow pact we have studied this in detail now we would move further and we would study montego chemsford reform All right students so now we are going to start with the Montego James Ford reforms of 1919 and we're going to start with the background of the reforms well lord james ford was the governor general of india and uh, edwin samuel montego was the secretary of state in 1919 and these reforms are named after these two people who presented these reforms montego and james ford so students we have studied it several times in the previous lectures that british was actually following a policy of occasional doses to pacify indians whenever there was a political unrest whenever there was some political development from indian side british would come up with such kind of reforms british would come up with momentary relief because they wanted to prevent the downfall of british empire in india they wanted to strengthen their rule in india so these reforms were also an effort to prevent the british rule in india but now this time the, the things were different a little bit different indians had become aware of their tactics and the pace of political development by indians had accelerated the movement of self government had gathered momentum in india but why it happened what made indian realize that now they should demand self government well students it all started with the world war 1 in europe world war 1 started in 1914 in europe and british came to the front as a champion of freedom british presented itself as an advocate of democracy and self rule and indians started questioning the role of british as an advocate of democracy and self rule indians started questioning this that if britain is a champion of freedom and if britain is fighting in europe for freedom and democracy then why british does not implement democracy in india what's wrong with implementing de- democracy in india this was the question of indians at the time so hindus and muslims got united and they started demanding self government from india they presented lucknow pact in 1916 and british government sensed a wave of unrest in india british sensed revolt in india so to prevent any revolt in india to prevent the downfall of british government in india they presented these montego james ford reforms so this was the background of the reforms what was happening in the society at the time what hindus and muslims were thinking what british was thinking this was all the background of the reforms now we're going to continue and we are going to study what were these reforms and what was presented in these reforms by montego and james ford so students we know that um, Indians started demanding self-government in India and British took notice of this unrest in India. Then in 1917 Secretary of State Samuel Montego made a statement in House of Commons. He said that the policy of his majesty's government with which the government of India are in complete accord is that of the increasing association of indians in every branch of the administration of gradual development of self governing institutions 
with a view to the progressive realization of responsible government in India as an integral part of the British Empire. This was the statement of Secretary of State and this was called August Declaration 1917. In this statement we can see that the Secretary of State is talking about the association of Indians in the administration of gradual development of self-governing institutions. This was the policy of Britain in India. They were just associating Indians in administration of India. Then Montego who was the Secretary of State visited India and he held meetings with government officials and political figures and in July 1918 Governor General Lord Chelmsford and Montego compiled a detailed report about constitutional reforms in India. So these reforms were actually based on this report. They did a detailed study and they came to the conclusion that the establishment of a responsible government in India had hitherto been impossible. Why? The reason they gave was the political and academic backwardness of India. They said that Indians lack political awareness. They are not politically aware and they are academically backward. So it is not safe to give the responsibility of governing India in the hands of these people. Therefore, they advised that government should be transferred to locals gradually and not instantly. So, for this gradual transfer of government to locals, they presented a system called diarchy. So, what is this diarchy? Let's study this. So, now we would study the main features of the reforms. The number of Indians in the Governor General's Executive Council was increased to three. Before these reforms, there were only two Indians, one was S.P. Sina who was a Hindu and the other one was Sayyid Ali Imam, he was a Muslim leader. So after these reforms the number was increased to three and a bicameral central legislature was set up. Now what is a bicameral central legislature? A bicameral legislature is the one that is divided into two houses. One was the council of a state which was the upper house and the other one was the lower house which was the Indian legislative assembly all right in upper house there were 60 members and in lower house there were 145 members this was introduced this was the feature of Montego James Ford reforms all right and the subjects were divided into central and provincial subjects. The subject of defense, foreign affairs, customs, relation with the Indian states, telephone currency and railway. These were the subjects that were given to central government and the provincial subjects were local self-government, public health, education, irrigation and agriculture. These were the subjects given to provincial government. So this was a kind of uh, government introduced in India after these Montego James Ford reforms right bicameral central legislature was introduced and the subjects were divided into central and provincial so we are starting the features of the reforms the members of the assembly could now move adjournment motion before these reforms the members of the assembly did not have the authority to move an adjournment motion but what is this adjournment motion? Well, this is actually the adjournment of the issue that is being discussed in the assembly by any member. If the member wants to steer the attention of assembly to an even important and urgent issue that is being faced, by the public 
if the person wants to discuss any and any other important and that is urgent also issue so the member can move an adjournment motion this was adjournment motion and before these reforms the members of the assembly did not have the authority to move this but after these reforms any member of the assembly could move adjournment motion the right of separate electorate for muslims was kept intact and it was decided that after 10 years a commission would be set up to assess the performance of the system now the most important feature of the reforms the system of diarchy a system of diarchy was introduced this diarchy was introduced at provincial level so diarchy actually means the authority of two authority divided into two in the previous slide we studied that a bicameral legislature was introduced this was an important feature of the reforms and the second important feature of the reform is the introduction of diarchy the subjects were divided into two some subjects were given to center like defense and uh, agriculture and forestry and telephone we studied this in the previous slide these were the subjects given to center but there were some subjects that were given to provinces also these were local self government and um, public health education these were the subjects given to provinces but at provincial level diarchy was introduced which means that the subjects of provinces were divided further they were divided into transferred subjects and reserved subjects now what are these transferred subjects transferred subjects were actually the subjects given to ministries from provincial assemblies ministers were there to take care of these subjects and the reserved subjects were given to secretaries and these subjects were supposed to be taken care of by the indian civil services these subjects were not given to ministries that is the that is the soul of parliamentary and uh, the parliamentary system these subjects were reserved by indian civil service so this was the system of diarchy at provincial level that provincial subjects were divided into two transferred subjects that were given to ministries and reserved subjects that was given to indian civil services this is not the feature of a parliamentary system but this was introduced by british to to keep the authority in the hands of the british government so this is the clever behavior of british so this is the diarchy system i hope that is uh, it is understood now and we would move now all right so now in the previous slide we studied that what is the system of diarchy diarchy is a system in which at the provincial level the subjects of provincial government was divided into two that is transferred subjects that were transferred to ministries that was transferred to provincial government and the reserved subjects that were reserved by the central government and that was given to secretaries of indian civil service right so now we would study that what were the subjects given to ministers from provincial assembly and what were the subjects reserved by the secretaries so police irrigation forestry judiciary revenue these were the subjects reserved by the secretaries of indian civil services and secretaries that were appointed by governor general were supposed to take care of these subjects and the subjects that were transferred to ministers were local self government education cooperatives agriculture and industry now here students try to analyze try to understand the policy and the game that british played british actually tried to keep all the revenue generating subjects 
in their own hands, in the hands of the government. And they transferred all the all the subjects that were consuming money to the ministers from provincial assembly. So this this was the game played by British because they wanted to pacify Indians and they wanted to keep the government in their own hand. So they played the game very well. They kept all the revenue generating subjects in their own hands and they transferred all the money consuming subjects to the ministers. So this was the this was the cunning nature of Britishers. All right, so now we're going to study how this system performed. Well, the system of Diaki could not perform well in India. There are definitely some reasons. First of all, it was the political atmosphere of India that did not let the system of diarchy perform well in India. The political atmosphere was extremely tense due to Rowlett Act. The Rowlett Act was passed in 1919 by British government. Well, this act showed how tyrannical British were towards Indian. This act actually gave the police complete authority to put anyone, any Indian under house arrest. This created a very tense situation, tense atmosphere in India and it did not let diarchy perform well in India. And other reason behind this failure of system is the massacre of Jallianwala Bagh. The massacre of Jallianwala Bagh is a very gruesome incident and we would study this in the next lecture. Well, this was uh, the massacre of Indians. Uh, many people died. Uh, I, I can remember, I think more than 300 people died in in Jalanwala Bagh massacre. So this incident also made the atmosphere of India tense and uh, British hostile attitude towards Turkey severely hurt the feelings of Muslims and uh, Muslims abandoned all the uh, govern government positions and uh, assemblies were boycotted. Khilafat movement and non-cooperation movement was also started and um, assemblies could not perform well. The distribution of provincial subjects was also inappropriate and governors were given unlimited powers that killed the soul of parliamentary system. So these were the reasons why these the, the system of diarchy could not perform well. Right. So this is all about the Montego James Ford reforms. But students, here at the end of the lecture, I would like all of you to analyze the situation. To what conclusion do you people reach? What do you understand now? We can do an analysis and now we can understand here that British in India were just trying to prevent revolt. They were just trying to strengthen their rule in India. They were just trying to prevent downfall of British rule in India. This is what they were doing. They were just presenting reforms after reforms. They presented this Montego James Ford reform just to prevent the downfall of British rule in India. They gave this, this excuse, this argument that Indians are politically backward. They are politically unaware. So they cannot run the matters of government. So we cannot give the authority in their hands. So we would have to introduce this gradual government processes in India. So this is the reason they introduced Montego James Ford reforms in 1919. Because they were just trying to pacify Indians. It was another 
momentary relief. Now we have studied a lot. We have studied the 1862 reform, 1861 reforms, 1892 reforms, and Mintomoli reforms, and now these reforms. So we can we can do an analysis that Britishers are just trying to are just trying to suppress Indians. They are just trying to pacify Indians. So this was their policy. All right. So this is the end of this lecture today. We studied the Lucknow Pact, which was a pact of Hindu-Muslim unity, and uh, Muslims just uh, wanted to be united with Hindus. But on the other hand, they also wanted to protect their rights. Also, all right. So this is the reason they demanded separate electorates in um, Simla deputation, and uh, Hindus, on the other hand, uh, could not digest their rights. They they did not want Muslims to demand their rights. So that was the view of uh, Hindus about on Hindu-Muslim unity. And uh, we studied Lucknow Pact in detail. And then we studied Montego, James Ford reforms. These two were interesting and important topics of pre-partition history. And um, this is the end of this lecture. And I hope that I have uh, delivered everything that I studied, all the knowledge that I gained when I was uh, preparing for CSS examination. I hope that I have delivered everything very well. I tried to make it easy and comprehensive. So this is enough for today. And uh, thank you and Allah Hafiz.